Hi guys. In the assembly programming part of this lecture, we began to implement functions in assembly. And for that, you have to store the address of a function in a register. So far, the mechanism that we used for that only works if this addresses can be represented with 16 bits. But in general, we might have uh, up to 64 bits uh, addresses. So this uh, approach so far will not work in general. I mean, as long as you write your assembly programs completely by yourself, you probably will never run into this problem because then you never generate uh, addresses that would exceed this limit. But still, we should consider this general problem and how it could be addressed. Our method of storing an address in a register only works if this address can be represented with 16 bits. That means as long as our programs are not larger than 64 kilobytes, we do not have problem. And for handwritten assembly programs in this lecture, at least, this is probably always um, no problem. But let me show you how you actually could generate some uh, scenario where even a handwritten assembly program requires more than 64 kilobytes. And then we can consider how to overcome this problem in general. I will begin with the instruction set that we developed for realizing this leaf functions. Let's make a copy of this instruction set and let's call this copy load 64. And I already can generate a computer architecture for that. And now I want to write a program that first uh, will work because no addresses will occur that require more than 16 bits. And then I will change it. So in the text segment, um, I begin with this main program, which will call a function, a function foo. So this address will be stored in register one. Then this function gets called. The return address gets stored in register two. And after the function returns, the program gets hoarded. And then down here, I want to uh, implement this function foo, which simply prints foo, of course, and then returns. So this should work, of course. This address of foo certainly can be represented with 16 bits. OK, prints foo, and that's what we expected. Now let's change this program a bit so that this address of foo is no longer representable with 16 bits. And for that, I use here an align directive. I want that foo is at an address which is a multiple of 2 exponent 16. So for an alignment, I can use hex 10000. And that actually means that foo will exactly have this address 2 exponent 16. Now let's see what the assembler is now uh, thinking about this uh, code. Well, exactly that. The address is now um, 2 exponent 16, not representable with 16 bits. It's not within this representable range. Let me also show you that if we now would uh, remove this uh, load instruction here and um, look at the generated code, we now have lots of zero bytes inserted for the alignment and this simple foo now has the address 2 exponent 16. From the ALU project, we know how to overcome this problem by using more than just one instruction if we want to load more than 16 bits into a register. And this approach is also used by the MX architecture. For that, we need a new instruction, which is doing a shift and a load. So that means we first shift the destination register to the left by 16 positions and then add a 16-bit immediate value. I will show you how to implement this in the UM generator. This is actually kind of simple. In the implementation part, you can use the shift operator from C. And then you also have to know how to use a so-called word operator provided by the Ulm assembler for accessing certain 16-bit blocks of an expression. And then I show you how to overcome this problem with this approach. Let me first clean up here a few things. Now I will add this instruction in our load 64-bit instruction set architecture. And so this will have opcode hex 1.5. And the instruction format is the same as this load instruction that we already used. So we have 16 bits for an unsigned integer and 8 bits for identifying or addressing 
a register. The mnemonic is short for shift load a word into a quad register. We want to load this bit pattern identified by XY into register set. And the implementation is uh, setting a register, so set rec. Uh, what do we want to set? We want to set it to what uh, register set contains so far. So ulm rec val of set. But this should be left shifted by 16 positions. And then we uh, want to add this bit pattern xy. And here, of course, we also can use a bitwise or hard. And this should be starting register set. So that's it. And now in the program, we can do the following modification. We still begin with a load instruction. But here we pick from the expression the next word, uh, w1. And that's uh, probably formally the second least significant uh, word from this expression. Initialize with that this destination register 1. And after that, we do this shift load uh, instruction. And here we pick the least significant word. Uh, that means in the second instruction, we do this shift and then add the least significant word to the destination register. And that's actually it. Okay, and now, of course, we also can look in the debugger how these two instructions work together. But maybe for that, it's um, better to use here a more expressive address where you actually see how this left shift takes place. You see this, of course, still is doing the same thing. Now, if we look at that in the debugger, you see after the first instruction, this register one will be initialized, even with that address, just with x1. Then this left shift uh, takes place and then you see that this uh, 2340 was added after this left shift. Now, of course, in general, two uh, instructions will not do the trick. In general, we have to do the following. We have to use here four instructions in the worst case, like that. In the first instruction, we load the most significant word, then the next uh, uh, less significant word, and so on. And this, of course, again works. And, and most of the time, we will just waste CPU time. As you will see, if I restart that in the debugger, you will see that the first two instructions will just have the following effect, that you will see here a zero-bit pattern in register one. Now it's initialized with a zero-bit pattern. Now it was left shifted, and the zero-bit pattern was added. And now we actually see something uh, gets done and then we can see this left shift. So using these four instructions will work in general, but it's not the most elegant solution and it's also not the most efficient solution. The ARM architecture basically has the same challenge as we. They also use 32-bit instructions and for function calls or for accessing global variables, they first have to load literals into a register and for that they have a very efficient and elegant solution. If some function or instructions in general require such literals, they make a so-called literal pool. That means they make copies of these values close to instructions that require these uh, values. And then they have additional instructions for loading the address of such a memory pool into a register and then for fetching from this memory pool certain values uh, into a register. And I will show you how we can do basically the same on the Ulm. I first show you how to set up a memory pool for our example, and then how to implement uh, and use this to other instructions. So I will first um, remove here this code, which is working, but uh, not so efficient and not so elegant. And later here, I will add instructions for uh, loading the address foo from this uh, pool of literals. And actually, I want to make this a bit more interesting by actually calling two different functions. 
And this second function bar will actually just be a copy of function foo. Okay, so I will make here some comments that this here is function foo. And I'm going to copy this. So this becomes bar and this becomes bar. And now the only difference between this two functions is that bar prints bar instead. And now I want to add to the main program this uh, literal pool. And for that I just use a quad uh, directive. And the literal that I want to store here is the literal foo. And here I want to store the literal bar. And that's actually it. Maybe I also should use here a comment that this here is the main program. Okay, now let me show you this literal pool in the assembler output. With the head command, I can see the first few lines of a file, by default, the first 10 lines. And then you see this quad word is the quad word foo. Uh, this here is the quad word bar. Here we have four bytes for alignment. Now let's also have a look at the symbol table. With tail I can see the last few lines of a file. And then you see this here is from the symbol table the address of function foo and this was actually added here in this literal pool. And the same here. This is the address of function bar and this address was added here. So that means what we have here is an array of addresses or an array of pointers the addresses of these functions or uh, pointers to these functions. And now I want to give this array a name, a label. And for that, I first uh, use here a dot align uh, directive. And then I usually would like uh, to have a name like dot pool. But then sooner or later, I will run into name conflicts because in general, every function will have such a pool. So let's use as prefix the name of the function, or in this case, the name of the program. And then we can now again look at the assembler output. So first with head a dot out, I can show you that at address 16, or in hex 10, we have the first literal, the literal foo with this uh, value. And here at hex, uh, one eight or uh, address 24 we have this second element and with tail a dot out we see now that this um, address 16 is also um, the value of this label main dot pool so the name of the array is the address of the first element now for doing the bookkeeping we have to do everything here by ourselves compared to c it is easier to have here labels also for each and every element in this array. And for that, I just use the same label as for the array, followed by a name for this element. And here it's easy to choose the names. Uh, I just use uh, .foo and .bar. And then a last look. The symbol table. Now we have this uh, two additional entries. This here is the address of the first element, which is the same as uh, the value for this label for the array. So the array label is the address of the first element, and this here is the address of the second element. Now in this block of code that requires this value stored in the literal pool, one instruction, some load pool address instruction, will load the address of this pool into some register. But that means, of course, that we are facing here the original problem of loading a 64-bit address into some register. But compared to the general case, we now know that this distance in memory from this load pool address instruction to this pool address itself is kind of rather small. So if we just uh, consider this offset. And if we have 16 bits available, uh, this is usually sufficient. 
if the function body is not uh, too large. The implementation for this will be similar to the relative jump instructions. We will add this offset to the instruction pointer, but instead of overwriting the instruction pointer, we store the result in some register. Now, also similar to the jump instructions, we can exploit the fact that this uh, distance is always a multiple of four. And so we can encode this offset actually like a jump offset. And that means we actually can have distances in memory from minus 128 kilobytes to plus 128 kilobytes. So first we need this uh, new instruction. And then I show you how to use it, of course. For the instruction, we also need a new instruction format. And actually, I just can copy this one here and change it a bit. Um, here, I just changed this into a jump offset. And the next instruction will have opcode x16 and this new instruction format. The mnemonic is load pool address offset xy into percent set, into register set. And the instruction is supposed to change some register, so ulm set register. We need the instruction pointer, so ulm underscore ip well. And to that we want to add this offset, so plus xy. And this should be stored into register set. And now we regenerate the ulm. And then we can test this instruction. Before we can load something from the pool into a register, we first have to load the pool address. That's dot main dot pool into a register, um, for example, register three, or better, let's use some EQ directives specifying that. So pool is equivalent to three and let's also use that for uh, specifying the function address in register one and the return address in register two. So that means I have to change percent one into percent func underscore adder and the return address is in register two. Okay, but now we can generate some assembler output from that and check it in the debugger. There you should see that this address of the memory pool, which is um, address 16, will be stored after the first instruction in register 3. So first instruction carried out. Here we go. This is the content of register 3. Of course, if we now would uh, continue the execution of the program, Things probably might go wrong because this register one uh, has some initial value, which is not the address of function foo or function bar. And you see after two instructions, we have this illegal instruction. So now we have the address of this literal pool, the base address of this array of 64 bit literals in some register. And from this pool, we now want to fetch single elements into a register. Let's say we want to fetch the second element of this array into a register. Then we first have to compute the address of this element. That means in this case, we have to add eight to the address of the pool because every element has eight bytes. So we have to compute this displacement factor. But of course, um, instead of memorizing that each element has eight bytes, we can use the assembler for doing the computations and the bookkeeping at least a bit uh, for us. And after computing this address, we can use our fetch instruction for uh, 
getting finally this uh, 64 bits in some memory. But then you see uh, each time uh, loading a value from the pool into a register requires some add instruction. And actually our fetch uh, micro instruction uh, can do something like adding a certain displacement to a base address. So we actually can do this in one sweep, uh, just using one fetching instruction by modifying it so that it uh, can take such a displacement into account. And that's what we will do next. So this is currently our move instruction. In this parenthesis, we can specify some base address. Now I also wanna um, be able to um, specify some displacement. And for that, I wanna use a notation that I know from the GNU assembler on my platform where I can put this uh, displacement in front of this parenthesis. And in the micro instruction, this here is the parameter for specifying this displacement. Now in the uh, program, we now can actually use uh, this fetch instruction. Let's first use it with um, self-computed displacements. The displacement for this first element is zero, of course, because it's the first element of an array and the base address is the address of the pool and this should be stored into a percent func header and the address of the second element is of course 8 and that's actually it now here we have to regenerate the computer architecture And actually up here, I can show you how the program works. Okay, great. Cause uh, foo and it cause pow. Let me also mention that, of course, if we would have a third, fourth uh, variable in this pool, this displacement always would be a multiple of eight. And of course, that means in encoding this displacement, we would always waste three least significant bits because they always would be zero. And of course, we can do better. But before I show you that, let me show you how EQ directives can be used to compute this offsets. In this case, it's of course uh, simple in general uh, by using the assembler. So let's say, this offset of foo uh, for main uh, should be called dot main dot foo. Then it gets computed by dot main dot pool dot foo, the address of the variable in the pool, minus the address of the pool itself. And the address of dot main dot bar, which should be the displacement for this variable bar in the pool, would be computed by using here dot main dot pool dot bar. And then you see the names get longer, but that's the price that you have to pay for uh, getting some bookkeeping from the assembler. Okay, so this would be a solution where the assembler is doing the bookkeeping partially for us. Uh, keeping track of the EQs is also, of course, kind of a bookkeeping. Okay, but now let's also address the last optimization for this uh, approach of loading 64 bit values into a register. You see that uh, this first offset, this first displacement is zero, the next is eight, the next is 16, and so on. And of course, we uh, just could change here this expression so that we uh, divide everything by 8 with an integer uh, division. And this, of course, would not work in this current form. Let's see what the assembler output looks like. Now, in the first fetch instruction, we still have the encoding correct. Uh, the displacement is 0. In the second fetch instruction, this displacement is 1, but it should be 8. But 
Uh, on the other hand, we are storing this uh, information more compact. But what I now do is I will implement a new uh, fetch instruction where this displacement always gets multiplied by eight. So it's important to load 64 bit addresses into a register. Uh, doing this um, literal pool is a important uh, way to do this efficiently. And so it also needs a efficient fetch instruction for fetching things from this pool, a special case that is important needs a special treatment. So basically I just copy uh, this and let's put it to here. So this will be Xcode 17. And here I always will have a displacement, so I will not change that. The displacement that I get from the expression uh, needs to be multiplied first by eight before I can use it in micro instruction. And then here we have to think about a good uh, mnemonic. So something like load from pool. And then we can make this work again. load from pool also here okay and then of course we have to regenerate the architecture down here and still working and most of all we now see that this more efficient encoding actually works. That's it for this video. On the website, you will find for both of these approaches more examples and additional information. And we also can discuss in class what other approaches do exist for this problem.